Wizards of the Coast will be releasing an updated version of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, which was referred to as 1D&D when it was first revealed, but the name has since been dropped. However, many people in the D&D community still refer to this updated version as 1D&D, or 5.5e. As of right now, 1DD has released a series of different playtests consisting of a plethora of balance changes, ruling overhauls, and a whole lot of other changes that are meant to be backwards compatible with the original 5e. While a lot of these changes can be hit or miss, in today's video we'll be going over some of the more well-received changes. Starting us off at number 10, we have a change that has probably gone unnoticed for the most part, which is a change to small creatures wielding heavy weapons. Normally, small creatures wielding heavy weapons causes them to have disadvantage on weapon attacks they make with it, unless they find a way to bypass their own size limitation via Potion of Growth or an enlarge slash reduce spell. But as the playtest 7 of the 1 D&D changes, this is no longer the case, meaning your barbarian gnome can comfortably wield a battle axe without any problems at all. This goes along with more recent changes in actual 5th edition, where the gap in penalties between small and medium sized races has all but completely closed, such as by having small races no longer receiving impaired movement speed for being small, for example. As a result, this opens up more opportunities in terms of class variety for smaller races. Rather than favoring more ranged or spellcasting classes so they don't have to worry about moving as much or swinging a big heavy axe or greatsword, which in turn might force them to use lighter weapons for smaller damage die. However, unlike most other rules in the game, this is one of those rules that kind of gets ignored anyway. Whether it's because players don't know the rules exist, or because of fairness, this change is actually quite small compared to other injuries on this list. But it is nice to have this change be codified to allow your halfling to swing a greatsword twice its size, since that's what the strength stat is supposed to help represent in the first place. And at number 9, we have Heroic Advantage, or Inspiration as it's best known. Inspiration is a mechanic that every player knows. Basically, it's a reward given out to players through their DM by virtue of good roleplaying or finding solutions by thinking creatively or otherwise. It's a system meant to help incentivize your players to think outside the box or encourage interaction within the game itself. Once you have this point of inspiration, you may then spend it to reroll any d20 roll you make, possibly turning a failure into a success. The only downside is that you can only have one point of inspiration at a time. In 1D&D, Inspiration has since been changed to be called Heroic Advantage and has received a number of changes throughout 1D&D's playtests. As of Playtest 8, Heroic Advantage not only works the way Inspiration normally does, it is now something that some classes or abilities actually grant you, while still being only limited to having one point at a time. As of Playtest 1, humans now get a trait called Resourcefulness which grants them Heroic Advantage after finishing a long rest. So, while Heroic Advantage functions exactly how it did when it was being called Inspiration, it now has in-game mechanics that you can utilize to gain Heroic Advantage without having to rely on impressing your DM or being super creative, which can actually be a benefit for players who are shy or just not used to how the rules of D&D can be bent or played with. And at number 8, we have the Guidance Cantrip being changed so that it uses the reaction instead of an action. Before, what Guidance did was allow you to enhance the ability checks of a creature within touch range to grant them a 1d4 bonus to any one ability check they make within one minute of having it. Then this spell ends. This is an amazing cantrip that could easily be spammed in almost any situation that calls for a skill check to the point where it was a necessary pick if it was available, since ability checks are the most common rules you'd be making outside of combat. As for the new version of Guidance, it might actually be even better than the old version, since it now has a range of 10 feet, and use your reaction at the cost of its duration being cut down to instantaneous, which doesn't really matter considering Guidance only affects one skill check anyway. And it only being available in response to a failed ability check makes this cantrip feel less spammy and more like a reliable tool you can use in response to something which makes this change feel really good at tables, since your cleric won't have to worry about casting Guidance every few moments just to squeeze out those extra 1d4 bonuses. Overall, this is a solid change that just takes an already loved and heavily used cantrip and gives it a fresh coat of paint that makes it easier to use and understand. It's not really as game-changing as some of the other entries on this list, as some tables actually do run guidance in this exact way anyway, if not similarly, which is why it only takes number 8 spot on this list. And at number 7, we have improved healing spells. This change basically made a number of healing spells in the game just heal for more. Most notably, spells like Healing Word and Cure Wounds are both raised from 1d4 and 1d8 to 2d4 and 2d8 respectively. Adding your spellcasting modifier to the amount of healing done, it now scale a lot better, with each level buff first increasing the healing by another 2d4 and 2d8. Mass Healing Word and Mass Cure Wounds also received a bump in the number of dice they use for healing at the level you cast them, while maintaining the original scaling of 1d4 and 1d8 per spell level upcasted. 
This is huge because healing in Dungeons & Dragons 5e comes with a lot of issues. The first issue is that the game has a central focus on dealing damage and finishing fights as quickly as possible, meaning both players and enemies will be dealing and taking a lot of damage in a short period of time. As a result, healing spells such as Cure Wounds only being able to heal 1d8 plus your spellcasting modifier isn't really that good, because the enemy can just out-damage that healing very easily especially if they have the ability to multi-attack or possess some other kind of deadly attack. However, one saving grace of healing in the game is the fact that you can use any healing spell or item in order to instantly bring back an ally that's fallen, bypassing any death saving throws they'd have to make while at zero hit points, and bringing them back into the fight. And this is actually such a strong strategy that because of this, D&D 5e has sort of adopted the philosophy of waiting until an ally reaches zero hit points before healing them once, since the only hit point that matters is the last one. As such, spells like Healing Word are actually better to use in Cure Wounds, in most cases, since Healing Word only costs a bonus action to use and can heal from afar, as opposed to Cure Wounds that use your action and requires you to be within touch range. With the improvements to healing though, hopefully more games will be able to run healing spells more regularly as options to use throughout a combat, rather than being encouraged to wait until an ally or party member falls. However, since the game is so damage focused, Adding an extra 2d8 per level of Cure Wounds above the first might not necessarily be enough to change how healers play all the time, and could instead exasperate the problem of waiting until a party member falls, since this would mean they would rise up with more hit points while still taking minimal damage. After all, there's no point in healing your fighter with one hit point that's taking 20 plus damage per turn when you just cast a third level Cure Wounds for 68 plus 4 if we're assuming 18 healer spellcasting stat, while they're at 0 hit points to restore an average of 31 hit points. In terms of mathematics, this is actually a more efficient use of restoring hit points than trying to keep your fighter up, since you can't drop into negative hit points. So a fighter taking 21 damage with one hit remaining would technically only be taking one damage, while the third level cure wounds would bring them back to around 31 hit points, whereas healing the fighter from one hit point to 32 with an average hit of the same cure wounds would then be left with 11 hit points after being hit for the 21 damage. Of course, this assumes the creature that downs the fighter doesn't immediately turn its attention towards another party member, but that's why Healing Word exists, allowing you to bring back your fighter from a safe distance, albeit at the cost of healing a little less. However, healing spells being buffed in general is a huge boon overall, since even if it's not enough to sway the playstyle of playing the waiting game and leaving your allies on as low of hit points as possible, it can at least add that much needed option of having healing spells that are strong enough to be used throughout a combat when someone drops low or to drop on your tank that needs to survive a big attack that they're about to take from a dragon, which is why this change ranks so highly on this list. And at number 6, we have a changes to Barbarian's 9th level feature, Brutal Critical feature, which is now called Brutal Strike. Originally, Brutal Critical allowed you to add one additional damage die to your melee attack whenever you landed a critical hit. So instead of rolling a 2d12 when critting with a great axe, you roll 3d12. The number of damage dice then goes up further one die at 13th and 17th levels, making for some pretty hefty damage. Brutal Strike, however, completely reworks how the original feature functions in such a drastic way that they had to change the name to what it is now since it no longer procs on critical hits. Instead, the way you activate this feature is by first having advantage on your attack rolls for your reckless attack feature, and then foregoing the advantage on your next attack roll in order to deal an additional 1d10 damage of the weapon's damage or unarmed strike whenever you hit. Afterwards, you can choose an additional effect to apply to your enemy. At 9th level, you only have the option to choose between two effects, Forceful Blow or Hamstring Blow. Forceful Blow causes your attacks to push the target 15 feet away from you and allows you to move up to half your movement speed towards the pushed creature without provoking opportunity attacks. Meanwhile, Hamstring Blow simply reduces the target speed by 15 feet until the start of your next turn. This list expands at 13th level by giving you two more options to use whenever you use your Brutal Strike feature, Staggering Blow and Sundering Blow, with Staggering Blow giving distance on the target's next saving throw, while also prevented from making opportunity attacks until the start of your next turn. And Sundering Blow allowing the next attack another creature makes against the target deal bonus damage equal to your rage damage. And once you reach 17th level, the extra damage you deal against creatures hit with Brutal Strike increases to 2d10, and you get to apply two Brutal Strikes instead of one. To summarize this change, Brutal Strike basically exchanges the devastating damage potential of Brutal Critical, and gives you more consistent but lower damage options than you can use as often as you want, since the feature doesn't specify that it's once per turn. You can just forego having advantage via reckless attacks, which applies to all attacks you make that turn. 
Additionally, Brutal Strike gives you the option to inflict all kinds of debuffs to creatures, rather than just dealing raw damage 100% of the time. And if you play your cards right, you can actually inflict a single creature with all four effects at the same time at 17th level, since you get two attacks to make as part of your extra attack feature anyway, which you can use to really ruin your enemy's day by debuff stacking. While being able to roll 5v12 every time you land a critical hit by 17th level, you still have to rely on actually landing those natural 20s to get any use out of Brutal Critical. While Brutal Strike is something you can just swing for every time you attack. However, there may be times where deadly or criticals might be preferred over the versatility of Brutal Strike. But the effects and availability of Brutal Strike is so good that, if anything else, it makes a good optional feature Barbarian players might want to try out, which is why Brutal Strike sits high at this list at the number 6 spot. And at number 5, we have a plethora of general changes made to the Monk class. The first major change we'll go over is the Monk's Martial Arts feature, which starts out dealing 1d6 bludging damage instead of the original 1d4 it used to. This is a very nice change, as it means you don't have to wait 5 levels to make your unarmed strike still decent damage. And since the progression of your Martial Arts die remains the same, your unarmed attacks will eventually go to 1d12 damage per unarmed at 17th level, as opposed to 1d10 at the same level. Another change to your Martial Arts feature comes in the form of Dexterous Attacks which allows you to use your dexterity instead of your strength for monk weapons and unarmed attacks, a feature already present in the base game, while also granting you the ability to use the dexterity modifier instead of your strength whenever you use grapple or shove a creature when determining the save for the DC. This change alone helps solve one of monk's major issues, stats being too spread thin. As it is, there are so many stats the monk wants to have, but can never have enough to fill them out in the ways that sacrifice other important stats, more so than other classes. A monk wants strength to be able to grapple and shove creatures, dexterity for better AC, initiative and damage, constitution for hit points, and wisdom for more AC and to increase their saving throw DC for stuff like stunning strike and other subclass features. So having to rely a lot less on at least one of these stats is actually very nice for this class, since this means you can leave strength at a lower number, but not dumpster tiered completely, and use those extra points to put into dex or wisdom. Along with these changes, there's also the changes to your key point abilities. The first obvious change is that they're now referred to as discipline points instead of key points, but otherwise function the same way as they always have. They're simply points you spend to do other things. And while you can still use Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, and Step of the Wind, as you always have, the abilities themselves have changed ever so slightly. With the exception of Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, and Step of the Wind not costing discipline points to use when using their base effects. On top of that, their effects have changed a bit as well. Patient Defense, for instance, allows you to now take the Disengage action as a bonus action rather than the Dodge action. But if you spend one Discipline Point, you can instead take both the Disengage and Dodge actions at the same time. Meanwhile, Step of the Wind lets you take the Dash action as a bonus action rather than letting you choose between taking the Disengage or Dash actions. However, spending one Discipline Point allows you to take both the Disengage and Dash actions together while also doubling your jump distance as it used to do normally. These changes basically allow you to do more on your turn as a monk without expending resources, while also giving you the option to do even more by expending resources. It never really made sense why a rogue could do most of the same actions the monk could do as a bonus action via its cut in action feature for free, while monks had to spend their key points to do the same thing but now that's a non-issue. As for Flurry of Blows, it's functionally the same. You spend one Discipline Point in order to make two unarmed attacks as a bonus action. The only real change here is that you no longer have to take the attack action in order to use Flurry of Blows like you have to in the normal 5th edition. But to top it all off, all three of these abilities now get even stronger upon reaching 10th level. Flurry of Blows lets you make three unarmed attacks instead of two, putting its damage more in line with the other marshals. Patient Defense now grants you temporary hit points equal to two rolls of your Martial Arts die whenever you spend a discipline point to activate it. Step of the Wind gets the funnier upgrade of them all by allowing you to drag along a willing large or smaller creature within 5 feet of you wherever you go whenever you spend a discipline point to activate this ability. The creature you move with you doesn't provoke opportunity attacks, making this a very good ability to reposition one of your allies in a pinch. Overall, these changes grant the monks some unique fun tools to use while maintaining their identity as a monk and iron out some of their key problems that monks are typically faced with. While this doesn't fix everything that's wrong with monks, it's definitely a step in the right direction and deserves to be on this list for just how useful these changes are in general. And at number 4, we have background feats at first level. This is a change that is sort of already used by a lot of tables and provides a little bonus DMs give to players as a treat to make a player's character feel a little bit more powerful or flavorful without really breaking anything in most cases. For example, gaining access to, say, the Magic Initiate feat at first level by having the Alkalite background is a very nice way to give your character something that feels unique to them 
in the form of certain spells. Or you can create your own background for your character by providing a number of different character creation features, such as ability score increases, skill proficiencies, languages, etc, etc, which have all been moved to the background creations in one D&D, while picking any available feat that you qualify at first level. There really isn't that much more to say about this change, other than it's a very good change that basically codifies a common house rule that many tables use, and doesn't really interfere with the overall power scale of your party, bearing a few exceptions. The only downside of this change comes with the downside of what the house rules already has, which is the ability to obtain certain powerful feats much earlier than you normally would. Lucky is a very powerful feat, which allows you to reroll a d20 roll for any attack roll, ability check, or saving throw that you make or reroll an attack roll made against you a total of three times a day, using whichever roll you desire for the results. At least, that's how it works normally. While 1 D&D has nerfed this feat slightly by making it only allowing you to make your rolls an advantage, while making your opponent's attack rolls with disadvantage full stop, while also changing the number of uses to being tied to proficiency, which is a nerf before 5th level and above a 9th level and above, this is still a powerful feat that can influence how a lot of early games can be played out. Overall, however, if this change does give characters the options to flesh out what they want out of their build, if that's something they're going for, or add something they feel would make their characters stand out better by taking a couple of cantrips in the Magic Initiate feat, etc, etc. And while taking more powerful feats might tip the balance of the gameplay in the early game, it usually balances out upon reaching higher levels, or earlier if your DM knows how to accommodate for it. And at number 3, we have an addition to the Rogue's General Kit in the form of Cunning Strike. This is a 5th level feature that doesn't replace any existing ones, like Brutal Strike does, but instead adds new ways for rogues to attack enemies. The way this works is that whenever the rogue deals sneak attack damage, they may spend some of their sneak attack dice in order to apply a secondary effect to the attack or target right before you roll for damage. Starting at 5th level, you can choose one of 4 effects to apply to your sneak attack, which all cost 1d6 to perform. Disarm forces a dexterity saving throw, whose DC save is equal to 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your dexterity modifier, or it's forced to drop one item of your choice that the creature is holding. Poison imposes a constitution saving throw where they'll become poisoned for one minute. The creature may repeat this saving throw at the end of each of its turns to end the effect early. And the only caveat to using the cunning strike option is to have a poisoner's kit on your person. Trip imposes a dexterity saving throw against falling prone when used against a large or small creature. And withdrawal provides an escape option by allowing you to move up to half your speed without provoking an opportunity attack after the attack. This feature improves upon reaching 11th level by allowing you to pay the cost of up to two cunning strike effects and applying them both. And at 14th level, you gain the devious strike feature, which adds three more cunning strike options. Days costs 2d6 to use and forces a constitution saving throw against a target, becoming days until the end of its next turn if they failed. Daze is a new condition introduced in one D&D and works similar to the way the slow spell does or Tasha's Mind Whip, where the Daze creature may only either move or take exactly one action on its turn, but not both, while also completely shutting off that creature's bonus action and reaction altogether. Obscure costs 3d6 of your sneak attack die and can cause a target to become blinded until the end of its next turn if it fails a dexterity saving throw against it. Finally, we have Knockout, which costs a whopping 6d6 of your sneak attack damage, but can completely shut down your opponent by making them fall unconscious for one minute, or until they take any damage, or if they fail a constitution saving throw against it. However, the creature may repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turn to try and end the effect early. This addition to the rogues kit makes them into a much more of a fun option to have by giving them different ways to use their sneak attack outside of just dealing damage. It's no secret that the rogue is a lot less consistent in terms of damage than other marshals, and it's widely accepted that rogues aren't the strongest at dealing damage comparatively to the other marshals either. So providing rogues with battle master fighter type abilities that they can use in place of that damage gives rogues some extra combat utility that both makes rogues feel more impactful, while also alleviating the lack of damage rogues normally have by just giving them the ability to apply debilitating effects to key enemies in a fight. This is an overall good change that grants rogues the option to make use of their key features in a variety of different ways. And if you don't feel like using any of these features, you can just still settle for dealing your full sneak attack damage, so you're also not losing anything by not using them. And at number 2, we have another change for Barbarians. This time, we have changes made to their rage mechanic that actually makes it more sustainable and easier to play with. Normally, Barbarians could only rage for up to 1 minute and have to attack enemies or take damage to not lose the rage at the end of their next turn. Now, that rage lasts up to 10 minutes and can now also be extended by forcing some kind of saving throw against the creature or by using your bonus action to extend your rage. This makes it so you can maintain rage even while outside of attacking range of other creatures or even outside of combat since 10 minutes of rage allows you to prepare for combat much easier by potentially allowing you to carry a single charge of rage through multiple combat encounters at best 
or freeing your bonus action at the start of combat at worst. Additionally, you can now regain exactly one charge of your rage whenever you finish a short rest, so you can always have at least one rage available at any given time. Though, you can still regain all of your charges of rage the normal way by finishing a long rest. What makes these changes so good is the fact you no longer have to worry about whether or not an enemy is going to attack you, or fly away and try to bait you into wasting your rage charge by just being out of range. However, with all these changes, there does come a nerf in all of this, which is why this change isn't higher on this list. Normally, range also ends early if a barbarian is knocked unconscious, which is usually done by reducing a barbarian's hit points to zero, or casting a spell that inflicts the condition like sleep through eye bite. One D&D takes this a step further by ending your rage if you're incapacitated, which is a lot more common of an affliction to have since incapacitated comes with a lot of other conditions such as being stunned. Despite this, however, the overall positives of these changes to the Barbarian's rage mechanic greatly outweigh the negatives, which is why it deserves to be on this list. And the number one change that One D&D introduces is the introduction of weapon masteries. This is a new feature added to the game which provides marshals a way of having more utility with weapons. With the exception of monks, every martial class can make use of weapon masteries via the weapon mastery feature that most classes gain access to at first level. These masteries can provide on-hit effects that may or may not be able to proc once per turn depending on the mastery used, with the effect being entirely dependent on the weapon being used. For example, the Great Axe comes with a Klee property, which allows you to, once per turn, whenever you hit a creature with an attack, make a second attack against another creature within reach, and that's 5 feet away from the first target, dealing your weapon's normal damage without any modifiers, unless it's a negative modifier. This gives characters that use Great Axes the ability to deal damage to one or more creatures, which can be very good for barbarians, since they prefer to be surrounded by a lot of enemies in order to soak up hits and be in a target-rich environment for their own attacks. Great Swords, on the other hand, come with the Graze property, which allows you to still deal damage equal to your ability modifier that you use for the attack roll whenever you miss. And this isn't a once per turn effect either. This makes Great Swords incredibly useful because even if you're not so accurate with them, you'll still be dealing damage regardless. The only caveat here is that you can't increase the damage that Graze does other than increasing the actual ability modifier. Still, this makes Great Swords an excellent weapon to use on fighters who like to make so many attacks in a single turn since max level fighters could just action search for a total of 8 attacks, which equals to 8 instances of free damage regardless of whether or not the fighter hits or misses their attacks. There are plenty of other opportunities for all the other weapons, and all of these give weapons a sense of uniqueness that was never really there otherwise. The reason this change takes number 1 on this list, and why it's such a well-received introduction, is because weapons no longer have to be tied to just their damage die. In some instances, a rogue might prefer the lower damage but extended reach of a whip due to its ability to now slow a creature and prevent it from running away from your party by cutting its movement speed by 10 feet, as opposed to a rapier's of X property, which allows you to have advantage on your next attack roll against a creature you hit and dealt damage to before the end of your next turn, since rogues don't get extra attacks and would have to wait until the next turn to take advantage of X anyway. Weapon masteries provide martial classes with more options and more customization outside of just creating their character. And, instead of picking the objectively best weapon for every class, you can now pick weapons that possess specific weapon properties that suit your playstyle. And while this doesn't solve the insane power gap between marshals and spellcasters, this feature does at least provide ways for marshals to use their turns in order to do something other than inflict damage. And some classes even synergize the weapon properties now because of the new changes in 1 D&D. Brutal Strike and Cunning Strike are both features that work well with weapon properties because you can just stack even more debuffs on enemies, for instance. And with the amount of properties available, this feature might even encourage a player to switch out weapons just to apply different effects if they really wanted. The potential to set up your own abilities or to synergize with a party member by just changing your weapon, along with the versatility utility this grants marshals, is more than enough reason for Weapon Masters to take the number one spot on this list. And that's the list. Do you agree with this list, or have any other features from 1D&D that you've been enjoying? Do you have any other ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments. Take care.